For a few sections now, I've been talking about how we do not have differentiation formulas for products or for quotients. Today we're going to, f to get some of those. We're going to start with products. Now, since we, since we know that we can split derivatives over sums, so we, we have a formula for sums where the derivative f plus g is just the derivative f plus the derivative of g, a very nice simple rule. It may seem natural that we can do the exact same thing with things with products. You might guess that if we have the derivative f times g, it would be the derivative f times the derivative of g. But this is not true. And we can see this with a very simple example. Let's look at x squared. We've, we've been using x squared as our example quite a bit, and we will use it here as well. Remember, x squared just means x times x. So any rule for products is going to have to work for this. The derivative of x squared is going to have to somehow be related to the derivatives of x and x. The problem here is that the derivative of x squared is 2x, whereas the derivative of x is 1. And of course, 2x is not 1 times 1. So we need a rule that somehow expresses the derivative of the product, this 2x, in terms of these 1s. Somehow we, somehow we have to make a 2x out of just 1s. And the solution here is that, so, that we're going to have to actually incorporate the factors, the original x's themselves, into our rule. So let, let's just write down the rule and, and we'll talk about where it comes from in a moment. The product rule. Assuming that f and g are differentiable functions, the derivative of the product of f and g is equal to the derivative of f, not times the derivative of g, but times g itself, plus f itself times the derivative of g. Basically, our rule does n never actually multiplies the derivative of f and the derivative of g with each other. Instead, we actually we take the, those two derivatives and multiply them to the original other function. So the derivative of f gets multiplied to g and the derivative of g gets multiplied to f. Let's go ahead and actually prove this. It's going to be a little bit more complicated than our proof for the for our, our sum rule, or for our addition rule. It's going to require a couple little tricks. First of all, let's start off by calling the, the product of f and g h. And we're going to differentiate h by using our, our limit definition. Remember the, the derivative of h, or you could say h prime if you want, is the limit as delta x goes to 0 of h of x plus delta x minus h of x all over delta x. Of course, because h is f times g, we can write this as, so h of x plus delta x, we replace the x's in both f and g with x plus delta x. So we have f of x plus delta x times g of x plus delta x. Of course, h of x is just what we had up here, so we have f of x and g of x. And we're still over delta x. When we're looking at the addition rule, we're able to immediately split up the f's and g's into two separate, into two separate fractions. But, but because we're multiplying this time, we can't do that. We, we, can't, we cannot split this term into two parts. It's just one term. So our trick here is to introduce new terms into here so that we can actually do some, we can start factoring stuff out. 
but we're going to have to both add and subtract the new terms so that we do not change the value of what we have. So let's start with what we already have. We still have the f and g of x plus delta x. Back here at the end, I'm going to put the minus f of x and g, times g of x. Everything's still going to be over delta x. But I'm going to both add, well I, actually I, I guess I want to I want to subtract first. Um, I'm going to subtract f of x plus delta x. Not times g of x plus delta x, but I'm actually I'm just going to put g of x. And then by subtracting this from here, I've changed it, so to, to compensate for that, I need to add it as well. So I'm adding the exact same exact same term. So I haven't actually changed my fraction at all. I don't want to change my fraction at all. But I've introduced two new terms that will actually help us out in the long run. If we look at the first two terms that we have here, notice that both of them have an f of x plus delta x. So I'm going to take those two first terms, and I'm going to put them over delta x, but then I'm going to go factor out the f of x plus delta x. So I'm going to have an f of x plus delta x. I'm going to have a fraction over delta x. And then what, what, I've, what I'm left with when I factor that out, I have a g of x plus delta x. And I have a minus g of x. Now I deal with these, these other two terms. Again, I can factor something out. This time it's g of x. Both of them have a g of x in them. So I'm going to make a fraction where I, where I factored out the g of x. Of course, I still have the delta x on the bottom. But now on top, I have this f, plus x, f of x plus delta x. And I have a negative f of x. Now, unlike derivatives, limits can be broken up over products, as well as sums. So, really, when I'm taking this limit of all this stuff, I can take the limit of this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece separately. So, we're going to, we're going to take the limits of all those different pieces and just put them all together. Of course, the very first thing that we can, we can deal with is this g of x at the end. Since there's no delta x's in it, that g of x just goes to g of x. It's technically a constant when it comes to delta x. The, the fraction involving f, the here f of x plus delta x minus f, f of x all over delta x. As delta x goes to 0, this is just the derivative of f. Pretty much by definition, that's what the derivative of f is. So this part just goes to the derivative of f. And we can do the sa exact same thing here. So here, the limit as, de as delta x goes to 0 of this fraction is just the derivative of g. Of course, these two are still multiplied together. We still have a sum in the middle. And now we've got to deal with this last part. Here's where another little trick comes in. So when we're taking the limit as delta x goes to 0 of f of x plus delta x, really what's happening here is that we have f of something that is going to x, because x plus delta x is going to, to x as delta x goes to 0. So we're really asking, does f have a limit at x? Well, recall that we, a few sections ago, we had a theorem that says when a function is differentiable, it is also continuous. And our product rule, because we're, we're, we're going to have the derivative f in it somewhere, somewhere, we're not going to be talking about the product of two functions that are not differentiable, we are assuming that f does have a derivative at x. 
And that means that f has to be continuous. That means this f of x plus delta x is actually going to just f of x as delta x goes to 0. So we have, we have to kind of bring that in here. It might, might seem a little obvious, but it is kind of something that we have to, we have to take into account. But the point here is we start with, with the derivative of this product, and we ended up with this thing, which is basically the formula up here. Uh, kind of the, the terms got put into a different order. I have the f prime times g over here instead of in front. But the, the order of the sum doesn't really matter. So this product rule is definitely something you want to remember. It's a very important formula. If we return to looking at x squared, we can see kind of how this works. Remember that we cannot use the ones that we had for the derivatives of x to make it 2x by themselves. But if we turn the derivative of x squared into the derivative of the product of x and x, then first we take the derivative of x, because that's our, that's our f in this case. So der the derivative of f is 1. Next we take our second one, our g in this case. That's an, just an x, so we take that 1 times that x. Then we add, now, now we're leaving the, the f alone, the f here being our x. And we're going to multiply that by the derivative of our g, which is again another x. So we get a 1 there. So we have the derivatives 1 and 1 for the x's, but then because we included the original, the original functions f and g, the x's that we have here, we end up with an x here and an x here, and so we have a total of two x's. And we get exactly what we expect to have. Of course, this, our prior rule couldn't mean anything if, if it didn't, wasn't consistent with the rules that we already found. Now before we start moving on to some to working out some problems using the product rule, I do want to mention that, that we can use the product rule for more than two factors. Notice that when we differentiated f times g, I'm going, I'm going to leave out the of f parts here, um, of, of x parts, so this is f of x times g of x, but I'm just not writing that part. We had the derivative of f times, the, times g, plus f times the derivative of g. And notice what we basically did here is we differentiated f and g separately and kept the other function the same. And in general, if we're going to do more than, more than two functions, if we have, say, three functions like this, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to differentiate each of our functions separately while leaving the other two alone. And then because then we had to cycle through all three three derivatives. So first we start with f, we take its derivative, but we leave the g and the h alone. Next we move on to differentiating the g, but we leave the f and the h alone. And finally we differentiate the h, but we leave the f and the g alone. And we get a formula for the derivative of the product of three, three functions. In fact, we can we can this idea really holds true for I any number of factors. If I if I wrote out 12 factors, I could write out 12 terms where I just keep differentiating one function at a time while leaving everything else alone. All right, let's put this into practice. Working out some problems from the book. We're going to start with problem 4. Here we have a function f of x, which is equal to 5x minus x cubed times 2x plus 9. And we're asked to use the product rule to find its derivative. And we just have to kind of remember the pattern. When we take the, we have two factors here. We, we find its derivative by differentiating this first factor. This is our I don't really want to call it the f in, in this case because we, we're calling the product here the f, but this this is the, the f in the formula for the product rule. When we differentiate 5x minus x cubed, remember we when we differentiate 
this, we, we basically take the 5 along, but the x becomes a 1 when we differentiate it. So this becomes a 5. For the x cubed, we, we're using the power rule. We take that 3, we bring it down in front, and we reduce the 3 down to a 2. So this is the derivative of this first factor. We take that first factor and we now multiply it by the second factor without changing that second factor at all. Now we move on to, well, now we're leaving this first factor alone. So we're just going to be left with the 5x minus x cubed. That doesn't change. But now we need to multiply by the derivative of the second factor. So the derivative of this, well, the plus 9 goes away because the derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of 2x, well, again, the x is going to turn into a 1, so we just get a 2. Now, technically, this is our answer, and we can just leave it like this without expanding things out. Now, if you do want to simplify things, we probably would expand things out. But if we were going to do that, we might as well have expanded out in the first place. But just, just to illustrate how this works, I am going to go ahead and expand this out now. But just, just note on your ho online homework, they will just take, take this form. You, you don't really have to expand everything out. You don't always have to simplify things in order to, for it to be the correct answer. But, it, of course, if we're going to use it for something, we might need to do that. But, I, like I said, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that for this particular problem just to show you how things can work here. So, first I'm going to go ahead and expand this, this part out. We have a product of two binomials, so we're going to have to FOIL it out. We have 5 times 2x, we get a 10x. We have the, the outer ones, we have 5 times 9, so we end up with a 45. Which I don't want that to be plus because we're taking a minus 3x squared times a 2x for our inners. So we have a negative 6x cubed. And finally we have a negative 3x squared times 9, so 3 times 9 will give us a minus 27 x squared. But then we also have this part over here where we distribute the 2 to both of our terms. That will give us a 10x and a minus 2x two, two cubed. If we go ahead and combine terms here, we ha I'll start with the constant term of 45. We have a 10x and another 10x, so we actually have a 20x. Um, moving on, go ahead and do the, the square term next, so we have minus 27 x squared, and we have two cube terms, negative 6 and negative 2 combined to be a negative 8 x cubed. We can compare this to what we would have gotten if we would have just expanded out f of x in the first place. So an alternate way of doing this that doesn't use the product rule is to take this thing and FOIL it out right away. So, of course, when we do that, we take our 5x times 2x, that gives us a 10x. We have 5x times 9, so we get a 45x. We have a minus x cubed times 2x, so we get a minus 2 times x to the 4th power. And finally, we have the minus x cubed times 9, which, be, which is a minus 9x cubed. Or if we go ahead and rearrange those terms, I'm going to go ahead and Wait, this should have been a 10x squared, sorry. There's there's an uh, x here and x here that multiplied together. But I'm going to put those into increasing powers of x. So we're going to start with the 45x, then the 10x squared, then the 9x cubed, or negative 9x cubed, and finally the negative 2x to the 4th. If we differentiated this directly, as it is r right now, the derivative of 45x, the x is going to turn into a 1, so we're just left with a 45. Here we have 10 times x squared. Well, the x squared is going to turn into a 2x. The 2 is going to combine with the 10, and we're going to get a 20x. Next, using the power rule here, we bring down that 3, which will combine with a 9. 9 times 3 is 27. And then the 3 gets reduced down to a 2. 
finally. We saw the minus sign here. We have a 2. We bring down that 4. 2 times 4 gives us an 8. And of course the 4 reduces to a 3. We get exactly the same formula, the, exactly the same derivative, as we should. I mean, if, the, if, the, if this didn't come out to be the same answer, then obviously something would have been wrong. But we, we do get the same, same answer either way. And which one you actually prefer is pretty much up to you. Though, of course, like I said before, if we don't have to simplify it, we might as well just do it, keep this answer right here, which is pretty, pretty quick and easy to get using the product rule. There will be some functions, not in this section, but in later sections, where we will actually have to use the product rule. And we, we can't actually ex just directly expand out like we, like we did down here. And so there are definitely examples where we have to have the product rule in order to proceed. But let's worry about that a little bit later. Let's, for now, we'll, we're just getting used to what the power rule tells us. So let's move on to another problem. Problem 8. We have an, another function that's a product. It's the product of 3 minus x times 4 over x squared minus 5. Again, we're just going to use the product rule, but remember here that 4 over x squared is the same thing as 4 times x to the negative 2 power. So the 3 minus x is still the same. I'm replacing the 4 over x squared with a 4 times x to the negative 2, so I can use the power rule. And then I still have the minus 5. The derivative of this function. Again, I'm going to take the derivative of the first factor. So the derivative of 3 minus x, well, the 3 goes away, and the minus x becomes a negative 1. Just because the minus sign sticks around, but the x is becoming a 1. I'm going to take that negative 1, and I'm going to multiply it by the second factor as it is. Now I'm going to leave the 3 minus x alone and I'm going to differentiate this part. Of course, when we differentiate this, the minus 5 goes away. It becomes a 0. And I have to use the power rule for this. Power rule says I take the negative 2 as the from the power, and I bring it down in front. And I'm not taking 4 minus 2. I'm actually I'm multiplying 4 times negative 2, which is a negative 8. And now the power goes down negative 2 minus 1 is actually negative 3. And again, we can actually leave it this way, or if you really want to, you can go ahead and expand stuff out here. In fact, this is actually simpler than the last one. There's, there's no binomials being multiplied anymore. This Here we just have a negative to distribute to both terms, and here we have a negative x to the negative 3 to distribute to both terms. So it's actually a little simpler than the last one. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it as it is right here. There's not really any, any benefit to, to doing that algebra at the moment. Now, if we wanted to solve a problem using this derivative, then we might do that. But for now, we're just, we're just getting a feel for what the product rule does. So we're going to move on to problem 10. Again, we have another, another product. This time it's a little bit bigger. We have an, an x squared minus 2x plus 1, and we have an x cubed minus 1. As we get more terms in here, the, the prior rule becomes even more useful because to, in order to actually expand this out, you have now you have six different terms instead of four. The more terms that you have in there, the, the harder it is to, to actually do the expansion. But the prior rule really doesn't get that much more difficult. We're going to take the derivative of the, of the first factor, so x squared minus 2x plus 1. When we differentiate that, x squared becomes a 2x. Minus 2x becomes just a negative 2, because the x becomes a 1. And the 1 becomes a 0, so we leave it out. That derivative is going to be multiplied by the second factor, as it already was. And then we move on. Now we're leaving the first factor alone. We have x squared, sorry, it should be a minus 2x plus 1. 
and now we're differentiating the x cubed minus 1. Derivative x cubed is 3x squared. And of course, the minus 1 just becomes a 0. And there's our answer. At least unless you want to expand things out, which I'm not going to do. Next, let's work on problem 33. Here they give us a function, it's a, actually h of t instead of f of x. So we're using t's for our independent variables, and our function is called h instead of f. But those are just letters. It's equal to one-third times the quantity, 6t minus 4. Notice here that we do have a product of two functions. But the first function is the constant, one-third. We could actually use the product rule here. And it will give us the correct answer. But because our, uh, one of our functions is just a constant, what we can use here is just the rule for multiples instead. Basically, the, the derivative is just going to be one-third times the derivative of this. So one-third times the derivative of 6t minus 4. And the derivative of 6t minus 4 course is just going to be a 6 because the t becomes a 1. I mean we're using t here but instead of x but it's the same rule and then the minus 4 goes away it becomes a 0. Of course 1 third of 6 is 2. The derivative here is 2. If we had used the product rule what we have to do is keep in mind that the 1 third here is a constant and the derivative of the constant is 0. So using the product rule We take the derivative of the first first factor, and we like I just said, that's zero. We take that zero times the the second factor. We add in, we leave the first factor alone, and now we multiply it by the derivative of the second factor. Of course, we already we already saw that the derivative of six t minus four is going to be six. And of course, this is 0, this is 1 third of 6, so we get a 2 like we had before. But w what we really ended up doing here is just having the constant give us a derivative of 0, which cancels out that term entirely, and then we ended up with the one that constant, the 1 third, times the derivative that, that we were looking for anyways. So really, using the product rule in this context just gave us a little bit more stuff to write. It didn't actually change any of the actual work. It didn't. It wasn't really an advantage in this particular situation. So if you can get away with using the rule for multiples, if one of your factors is just a constant, go ahead and do it that way. It will be. It'll be shorter, basically. It's not that the product rule no longer works. It's just the more complicated route. Let's do one more problem with the product rule before we move on to the quotient rule. We're going to look at problem 45. We're returning to f of x instead of h of t this time. And we have a 3x cubed plus 4x times x minus 5 and times x plus 1. Here we have three different factors. And when we differentiate, we can actually still use the product rule, but we have to differentiate each factor separately while leaving all the fa other factors alone. So this is going to ha end up having three different terms to it. So it's, it's going to be a longer problem, but it's not actually going to be much more difficult. So I'm first going to take my first factor, this 3x cubed plus 4x. I'm going to differentiate it, the derivative of that, we're going to have to use our, our power rule here. 3 times the 3 that we bring down from the cube is going to give us a 27. And then I'm going to reduce that 3 to a 2. Then I have the 4x will become a plus 4. So that's the derivative of this first factor. And I leave the other two factors completely as they are. I'm not going to do anything to, to those. 
Next, I'm going to go ahead and differentiate the middle term. The x minus 5, the derivative of that is just a 1. And then I leave the other two terms exactly as they already were. So I have the 3x cubed plus 4x, and I still have the x plus 1. So let's go ahead and highlight the ones that have actually been been differentiated. So this part this part was differentiated, this part was differentiated, but everything that's that's left in black is going to be stuff that was already there and left alone. Finally, we're going to go ahead and differentiate this last factor. So this is just going the derivative of x plus 1 is just 1. But everything else is exactly as it, as it started out as. So we still have the 3x cubed plus 4x, and we still have the x minus 5. And that is our derivative. And unless we want to expand this whole thing out, we can just leave it as it is. In fact, I really don't want to have to, have to do all the algebra of expanding this out unless I really needed to. The only thing I, I might do, though, is I might, I'd probably just, I'd remove the, the factors of 1. This, this one here and this one here, they might as well just not be there. But I'm a little too lazy to go ahead and rewrite everything just to take those two out. So hopefully by this point you've got a good idea of how the product rule works, and we can move on to our other rule. But I'll do that in another video. So I'll see you in that one.